write something on the chat to make sure that I see it while I present. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I'll just I'll write it down. Um, okay, so I did not see that. I need to open the, okay, so, okay, I'll, I need to open the, uh, the window. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can right. also, uh, if so, you're ready, to, uh, if you're ready anytime to take questions, you can also let me know and I can ask the questions for you. Uh, okay, okay. Whatever works for you. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm very open to questions during the, the presentation. I, I, I like when that happens. Um, okay, so I will start uh, straight away by uh, acknowledging uh, Nicolas, who is uh, uh, um, I, uh, my collaborator for the for the work that uh, that we've done, and Yuan, uh, who is my PhD student, and she's working on um, making it even better. So today we will uh, uh, cover first. I, I know that uh, not everyone is an expert, so I want to uh, to give you a simple introduction to quantum optics, or at least to the things that uh, are necessary to understand uh, to understand this work. Um, and then I will present the uh, our algorithm, which is a recursive uh, algorithm for simulating Gaussian gates and what they do uh, to uh, to Gaussian states and to uh, other states of light. Um, and then uh, we will go into the uh, the, the further step, which is the differentiability of this algorithm. So uh, I will talk about uh, gradient-based optimization, and then I will uh, present the, the uh, differentiable version of the algorithm for optimizing Gaussian gates. So not only we are able to, um, uh, to simulate uh, these gates, but we, we can also, since they are parameterized gates, they, we can tweak the parameters uh, to optimize um, whatever uh, objective function we define. So the big picture is to have a, um, a fast differentiable simulator. And so you, you can see here, we have uh, some input quantum states. We have some uh, uh, circuit that is parameterized. Here, I just wrote theta, but I mean, we, have, we can have uh, um, a lot of parameters. Um, and then we have some output, which then depends on, on the parameters. And what we do here is we evaluate this output and depending on uh, how happy we are, and, and what we can do to make it better, uh, then we can um, uh, run the same simulation with a different set of parameters. And so there will be this loop uh, that goes back and forth between the, the simulation of the, uh, of the uh, gate, of the, of, well, of all the gates that make the circuit, um, and then this estimation uh, and evaluation of new parameters. And the applications for, uh, for, this, um, uh, for this type of, of, of algorithms uh, that at least the ones that I have in mind are, uh, for example, having uh, automatic design of new devices. Um, I imagine a situation where um, we would like to have some quantum device that uh, can perform some type of transformation. And all we have to do is to, is to tell the optimizer what we would like the device to do. And then the idea is that the optimizer comes up with, uh, with the right design and you know which interactions uh, should go where and which optical modes should um, interact with which other ones and how. Uh, and so all of this design uh, in principle should be uh, automated. And then we can also uh, simulate quantum algorithms. I, I guess um, some of you have recognized the similarity between uh, the picture here and variational quantum algorithms where uh, we have a real quantum device um, that performs some um, uh, transformation of input quantum states and then uh, we make a measurement actually on the output so we don't have access like in this simulation to the whole uh, wave function um, but nevertheless there is this this loop between uh, a quantum uh, operation on quantum states and a classical computation and so because our uh, uh, simulator is particularly fast we can also simulate uh, quantum algorithms to a, in a bigger scale um, and um, other, another couple of, of uh, directions where I want to go with this, uh, with this project is that um, one, uh, one, one application is to develop uh, quantum state sources. So we know that for many experiments and many applications, uh, it's important to, uh, to have a reliable source of quantum states that produces exactly the states that you want. Um, and so this could be one of the, one of the applications to, um, to um, design these um, uh, quantum state sources. And finally, another uh, great application would be to uh, um, in the domain of quantum communications, um, because we know that uh, you know quantum communications are, are 
a great technology for the future and the future quantum internet. And, and so it would be great to be able to communicate quantum states, uh, and particularly quantum states of light at great distance. And um, this is, though it's very hard to do because optical fibers are leaky and they, uh, they scatter light, they absorb light. And in particular, quantum states are very sensitive to, this, uh, to these effects. And so it would be, it would be great to develop quantum, bosonic quantum error correction. So devices that are uh, capable of maintaining the, the quantum information without letting it uh, leak out. And, and since all of these uh, um, technologies based on uh, transmitting light, then uh, you know, photonic circuits uh, are, are uh, the, the potential, potentially the best platform for, uh, for bosonic quantum error correction. Um, so I want to uh, make sure that we are uh, on the same page on the differences between, uh, let's say, more conventional uh, uh, quantum circuits uh, and um, optical quantum circuits or photonic quantum circuits. So um, in the qubit case, uh, so in, uh, on the top, I have an example of the, of the, uh, the quantum circuits to do a teleportation. Uh, so you see here, every, it's implied that every system uh, is a qubit. So every system in, in the qubit picture is two dimensional. And then we have a set of gates uh, to operate on the, on the qubits. And we have uh, gen generally to, to achieve uh, uh, universality, you need uh, Clifford gates plus some non-Clifford gate, for example, the T gate. Uh, in a similar way, um, in the, so below I have an example of a, of a photonic circuit. So we still have systems that interact with this uh, through these gates. Uh, so we have gates that operate on single systems. We have gates that operate on multiple systems. Uh, but here the systems are not two-dimensional. They are infinite dimensional. And in fact, each system is an optical mode. And an optical mode can be filled with photons. So you have zero photons, one photon, two photons, et cetera. And th that uh, um, set of states makes a basis for an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And that describes a single mode. And we have many modes and we make them interact together. So this is a, a, you know, a quite a, a stark difference between, uh, between the two cases, um, but it's, it's one of the most important ones. Um, and as far as the gates are concerned, we have some uh, analogy uh, because also in the, in the photonic case, we have a set of gates that is easy to, um, uh, let's say, to, to simulate and to, and to um, um, and to deal with, also mathematically speaking, which are the Gaussian gates. And they are kind of, kind of analogous, uh, quote, uh, to the Clifford uh, gates. Um, also in the sense that they don't give us the possibility of, of doing universal computation. But as soon as we add something that is non-Gaussian, like the Kerr gate, for example, uh, then we, we do, then we have that ability of doing universal computation. And um, the type of um, uh, structure that, that we go for, so that the architecture will be made of uh, layers. So every layer is um, uh, operating on several modes, could be one, two, or more. Um, and the architecture of, its of each layer is fixed and it's uh, represented below. So we have here, I, I will explain more in detail in, uh, in the coming slides what exactly this, uh, these interactions are. Uh, but just to give you an idea, we have uh, two mode mixers that are sandwiching uh, a series of uh, single mode squeezers. And then there is a, a series of single mode displacements and then a series of single mode care interactions. Um, and I want to point out, point out that this structure also uh, is reminiscent of a, of a classical uh, dense neural network uh, because um, we will see that all of the operations in each layer apart from the last one, apart from the, from the care gate, are linear transformations and the care is nonlinear. And this, this reminds us of the, uh, of the structure of a dense neural network where we have uh, um, a linear transformation followed by nonlinear activation in each, in each of the layers. And I think it's also for this reason that this type of architecture is, is able to give us the, the most general type of circuits uh, in the most uh, compact way. So let's, uh, now that we uh, introduced a bit uh, the problem and, and what, uh, what, is, what is the final goal, let's uh, look a bit at uh, quantum optics. So just some, some notions. Um, and one of the most important uh, ideas in quantum optics is to start from the classical uh, optics. So the classical uh, picture of, of, from the electromagnetic field. Um, and, and let's try to define what these optical modes are. 
So the, um, each optical mode uh, is defined as soon as we define uh, uh, the properties of the electromagnetic field. So the, the electromagnetic field has properties that are related to space, so the, to the 3D uh, uh, space, uh, to frequency uh, and time, uh, and to polarization. So in this example, uh, if, you, if we say that we have uh, a, a pulse that is uh, Gaussian shaped, for example, in, in space, uh, we can say, for example, that it's monochromatic, and we can say that either uh, in the in the frequency uh, domain or in the time domain. Uh, and then, for example, we can say that it's, let's say, vertically polarized. Then as soon as we have identified these properties, then uh, we, have, we have also identified an optical mode. And so optical modes are uh, states, uh, are well, uh, they are uh, um, ways of being of the electromagnetic field. And uh, they are very useful because within, if we restrict ourselves to an optical mode, then uh, the, um, um, the Maxwell equations, uh, if we massage them in the right way, uh, they look like the equations of a harmonic oscillator. And this is extremely convenient because we know extremely well how to, uh, how to deal with harmonic oscillators. Um, they, they occur everywhere. Uh, we have, for example, if you look, so on the left, we have the, uh, um, these this, um, um, equations for the uh, real and imaginary part of this quantity alpha, which is a combination of uh, the vector potential amplitude. That's why I said that you need to massage things a bit. Uh, but once you do that, uh, you have uh, these differential equations that look exactly like, for example, the equations of a mass on a spring or an RL circuit. Um, and so in this case, obviously the, the, the quantities that are uh, changing with time are completely different, but the structure is the same. So we have, yeah, as I was saying, the real imaginary parts of this, uh, of this uh, um, mode function. Uh, and then in the case of a mass of a spring, on a spring we have position and momentum, we have uh, charge and flux for uh, NRL circuits, and, and there are many other uh, examples. And, and the most in interesting and useful feature of, of uh, you know, describing the, uh, the electromagnetic field out of, as made out of uh, harmonic oscillators is that um, our harmonic oscillators uh, remain isolated from each other and they evolve independently if they are in vacuum. So we can just concentrate on one of them uh, and, and, and worry about describing one, and then we can uh, describe the, the whole field as a collectivity of, uh, of optical modes. Um, this also allows us to, uh, to uh, leverage uh, a useful type of representation, which is the classical phase space. So in the classical phase space, the, the state of a system is uh, a point on the space, um, this is the case of a, of a single oscillator. Um, and then the evolution of the system uh, uh, is um, described by the movement of this, of this point on the phase space. And in the case of a harmonic oscillator, uh, then the, uh, the, the, the point just rotates around the origin. So it's a very convenient way to visualize how the system evolves. And, and we will have a, 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 an analogous uh, phase space for, the, for when we go to the, to the quantum picture. And now we go to the quantum, to the quantum picture. And what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna do a quantization uh, uh, in, the, uh, I'm gonna do Dirac quantization. And this is really kind of magic because if you think about it mathematically, what is happening is that we are replacing real numbers, like real quantities uh, with operators. So we are, uh, you know, like expanding the, the, the size of the, of the, of the whole um, theory by introducing a lot of, a lot more degrees of freedom. Um, and the only justification that we have for it is that it works. So what we do now is we say, well, uh, the quantities that we have found are analogous to uh, those of a harmonic oscillator. So let's replace them by uh, X and P, the, the, the position and momentum operator of a quantum harmonic oscillator, and we enforce uh, a commutation relation. And this is enough uh, to, uh, to transition from the classical picture to the quantum picture. Um, I want to also point out that already at this stage, we can see that for a harmonic oscillator, we have an infinite dimensional uh, uh, state space. And that is already embedded in the commutation uh, relations because I, I actually I, I, um, I became a grown up before uh, seeing this thing for the first time, but it makes a lot of sense in retrospect. And it's that if you look at the trace of uh, the, uh, the commutator, 
then you know you can develop the commutator and the trace is linear so you can split the, the, the trace of xp and the trace of px and because the trace is cyclic so you can uh, uh, exchange p and x inside the trace then you should get zero but you don't get zero if you take oops if you take the trace of uh, the right hand side of the commutator which is ih bar and so there is uh, um, some, some something is wrong here right so what is wrong well what is wrong is that uh, the the, uh, uh, the last line is correct if the space is finite dimensional. So if X and P are matrices, uh, but X and P are technically not matrices; they are differential operators because the space is infinite dimensional. And this is kind of the, the signature of, of that fact. So we have an infinite dimensional um, uh, state space. And once we we have understood the trick, then we can keep playing it, right? So we can we can uh, also take the Hamiltonian of the classical harmonic oscillator, and we can replace X and P as operators, um, and um, and with with that in our hands, we can now say, okay, so we have this, this operator that represents the energy of the system, and we can look for its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors. So, for example, we can see uh, that the eigenvalues are discrete. So the, this, is a, this is a new thing that uh, is true in the quantum case in, in, and it's not true in the classical case. So the eigenvalues are discrete, which means that the energy of the, of the harmonic oscillator comes in chunks. And these chunks are called photons. If you have a different system, like if you have, let's say a mechanical oscillator that, is, that still works in the, in the quantum regime, then you, you would have also that its energy is quantized and the chunks are called phonons in that case. So we have lots of different types of um, uh, physical systems that behave like harmonic oscillators um, and that can also uh, uh, be described in the quantum regime. And each of them will have their own uh, type of, of excitation. So for us, it's the quantum uh, electromagnetic field. So the, the excitations are the photons. And uh, so we call the eigenvectors uh, with, uh, with this um, uh, Dirac bracket notation and they form the basis of, well, a basis of the Fox space. So the Fox space is the space, uh, that is the, the state space of a single mode. And now phase space, uh, uh, we, need to, we need to have a description in phase space also for the, for the quantum state. And because of, uh, I mean, there is, a lot, there is a lot more detail that goes into it, but to summarize it, um, uh, once we have uh, uh, the, the, in, in the quantum picture, we need to take into account uh, of um, uh, Heisenberg's principles. So we cannot have a single spot in phase space that describes the system. We cannot know the momentum and the position uh, uh, exactly. So we will have some, some blurred uh, uh, function that describes the state of the system. Uh, but the interesting thing that is that there exist two equivalent or equivalently powerful uh, uh, descriptions of, of, uh, of, of the system and its transformations and its evolution. So one is in uh, phase space and in phase space we have this uh, plane associated with every optical mode uh, and the state will be some function on the, on the space and the, the evolution of um, of, uh, of, of this function uh, is, so the transformation of the quantum state will be represented, for example, by a, um, well, in general, it will be some uh, differential uh, equation, right? Because we have a function and uh, the function evolves. Uh, but sometimes uh, the, the description of the evolution is really simple and we will see examples of that. On the other hand, we can describe everything in Fox space instead. So now we have uh, uh, this uh, um, infinite dimensional, dimensional Hilbert space and uh, whose basis, uh, for example, is the, uh, is the, sing is the, uh, the photo number basis. Um, and we describe states as some superposition of the, of the states uh, of, of these bases. So here, for example, on the left, we have, um, I tried to, uh, uh, to depict a, a coherent state, which is a, a Gaussian in the, in the uh, phase space. And on the right, I wrote the equivalent def definition of a, of a coherent state but written in, uh, in Fox space. So, and so we have uh, these two uh, parallel descriptions and there are also ways to go between one and the other. So there is a class of operations that is really simple. Uh, uh, it acts in a very simple way on, uh, on the uh, states in phase space because uh, it's a passive transformation. So it's a transformation 
of the axis. It doesn't matter what the state is. It doesn't, we can describe these transformations by instead of acting on the state, we can just act on the axis. And, uh, and you, as you can see, these are uh, linear transformations. So they are represented by matrices, um, by well, two by two matrices if we have uh, a single phase space, uh, four by four matrices if we have, for example, a pair of phase spaces. Um, but definitely these are, these are uh, linear, simple linear transformations. So we have phase rotation, and as you can see, this is a, a rotation matrix applied to the axis. Uh, displacement, we are just uh, changing the position of the origin. Uh, squeezing, it's a, um, it's a squeezing, so you, you change, you scale one axis in, a, in one direction and you scale the, the other axis in the opposite direction so that the product of the two remains constant. Um, and then here we have also a, a, an example of a, a transformation that uh, is able to make two different modes interact with each other. It's a beam splitter or mode mixer. Uh, and in, in this case, we, uh, we can describe it, describe it in a super simple way. It's a, it's a simple rotation of, so the two X axis of the two planes rotate into each other and the two uh, Y axis uh, rotate into each other in the same way. Uh, and it's for this reason that um, sometimes you hear that squeezing is a linear transformation. So it's linear in this sense. Otherwise, I mean, there, there are other, other ways in which the squeezing is not linear, right? So for some, of, some properties of the squeezing, for example, depend on the square of the uh, electric field. So, so there are ways in which the squeezing is not a linear transformation. But when you hear that squeezing is linear, this is what it means. It's a, it's a linear transformation of phase space. So these are all nice. However, because since they are uh, transformations that can also apply to, to states, well, that they do in, in the end of, at the end of the day apply to quantum states, they must also have a representation on Fox states. And, and in fact, we can represent them also as operators on Fox space and phase rotation, for example, is uh, the, and by the way, they're all exponentials of some operator. Uh, so they are um, matrix exponentials. And they are infinite dimensional matrices now, if, if, if we want to describe them as matrices. Uh, so not, not two by two anymore, but infinite by infinite uh, matrices. And you have, we have phase rotation, which is just a diagonal matrix, matrix in the number operator. Um, then for displacement, squeezing, and misplitter, then we need these um, um, mode operators and we can combine them in some way. And here, for example, you see that squeezing now is quadratic in the, oh, I'm missing a, there should be a square uh, in the in the a dagger of the squeezing. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a quadratic operator in this sense, but it's a linear operator uh, if we look at phase space. Uh, and then on the on the right hand side, I've uh, given you an example of a non-Gaussian operation, the Kerr gate, uh, the Kerr interaction, which is quadratic in the uh, in the number uh, of photons. And for example, if we if we wanted to uh, um, to describe all of these operations as matrices, well, we couldn't because the care operation is not a passive transformation. It's not a transformation that we can just apply to the, um, uh, to the axis of the phase space. It would, it would become some non-linear some non transformation, some, uh, um, for example, like a, a differential equation that applies to the, to the quantum state. So there are some advantages to work in uh, Fox space. Uh, and for example, an advantage is that the space is, uh, is described by a, just a vector space. So every state is a vector and every um, operator is a matrix. Uh, and, and this is kind of the reason why we need to work in Fox space, because if we only had to deal with Gaussian operations, well, then we would just use this very simple description and everything would be a two by two matrix. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and everything would be easy, but then, but then there would also be no need to do, uh, to do much with it, uh, because it, in a similar f way in which, um, if you want to make qubit circuits just with Clifford gates, well, then, then you cannot make powerful algorithms out of those because you can also simulate them very easily. Uh, it's only once you introduce these, uh, non Clifford, um, gates that, the circuits become hard to simulate and therefore they give you the potential uh, to do, to do uh, uh, some non-trivial computation. So in a similar way here, all the non-trivial stuff that we can do with, uh, uh, well, a lot of non-trivial stuff that we can do with, uh, uh, with photonic circuits is enabled by the presence of these non-linear transformations. Uh, and therefore there is kind of this need to, uh, to work in Fox space. So now that we understand what, ah, by the way, uh, 
I want to take a pause now and, and take some questions if anyone uh, would like to, to ask me something before I uh, proceed. And I, I can see the chat if, uh, if you write on it. Okay, maybe for, uh, we'll have questions afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so when I say simulation of gates, I mean simulation in the fog. Um, when you say infinite dimensional, in what sense is this infinite? Um, well, so you see that there is an index here. Um, oops. So n, uh, it's it's the index that in that um, that um, describes which eigenvalue or with or how many photons we are considering, and it's infinite in the sense that there is no reason to to stop. Like if if n is a million, well, there can be also be a million and one photons. Uh, so in in that sense, is it's infinite. I think it's not actually going to be infinite at some point you may you make a black hole but uh i mean if if you know if we take this level of of uh, abstraction then it's it's infinite in that sense um right but but as as david is um, um it's pointing out the, the, there may be some problem here, right? Because how do we simulate something uh, uh, that is infinite dimensional? And effectively, we can't, right? So we have to we have to uh, truncate the space at some dimension. But this introduces problems. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you what problems uh, come about and and how we we got around them. So first of all. What we do, the first step that we do, is we combine the elementary gates uh, to form a general Gaussian gate. And there are several ways to do it. So this is an example for a single mode. Uh, so the block messiah decomposition is, is uh, a way, well, actually, the, the decomposition goes the other way around, but it also gives us a, a guarantee that we are doing uh, things in the right way. So if we take uh, a product of um, displacement, let's say, uh, phase rotation and squeezing, uh, then each of these uh, uh, gates depends on a parameter and um, and by taking this um, sequence we can form we can essentially span the whole set of Gaussian gates for a single mode and there are equivalent the uh, decompositions uh, the for uh, two and more modes so what we do is we say okay so this is what we need to do we if we want to describe a general Gaussian gate we need to consider it as the product of multiple individual uh, gates and this has uh, um, um, this was our starting point. And what we did is we found a recurrence formula for the matrix element of the Gaussian gate of G directly. And this is great because first of all, it's incredibly faster uh, than uh, than any other method that, that was uh, that, that existed before. It's more than a hundred times faster, in fact. Um, there are no truncation errors, and I will explain what truncation er errors are, which are exa exactly the ones that uh, come out from the fact that the space is infinite dimensional. And most in interestingly is that our recurrence formula is differentiable. And if it's differentiable, then we can um, uh, apply these machine learning algorithms like gradient descent um, to optimize the, the parameters. So how did we do it? Ah, for first of all, uh, the, the truncation errors. So um, if you take uh, the product of two matrices, then let, let's look at the, the first, uh, ele the top left element of the, of the result. Well, that will be the inner product of the first row of the matrix on the left and the first column of the matrix on the right. Now, if we truncate the matrices, you see that we don't have access to some of the values that would have influenced the result. And so if we, if the, and, and, and there is no right way to do it if you have infinite dimensional matrices, whatever uh, truncation size you pick, you will always be neglecting some of the values. And so it seems that when, you, uh, when, you, when we put together those individual uh, um, uh, gates to form the general Gaussian one, well, the matrix elements of the general Gaussian gate will always be wrong because we will never be able to take into account all of the, uh, all of the values uh, of, the, of, the, of the matrices that are composing it. 
but we got around that uh, uh, by using two insights. One was the, the generating function method. So we are uh, looking, we are using generating functions. Um, and the other one is uh, a result that uh, was really unexpected. Uh, um, and, um, and, and I, I found that you can define uh, um, derivatives of the exponential function uh, in a recursive way. And so if you have a, a, the exponential of any function, um, a multivariate function, you can define uh, multivariate derivatives of any order uh, in a recursive way. And this turns out to be extremely fast. So first of all, let me uh, um, remind you what a generating function is. And I think that the best way to think of a generating function is as a container for a sequence. Let's say you have a sequence of numbers, a n, a sub n, um, then you can use it to define a function. Uh, so for example, you can write a function as a power series by using that sequence. Um, and G now is the generating function. And, it, and it, inside of it, it contains the sequence. And so if you want to go from the generating function back to the sequence, you just differentiate an appropriate number of times uh, and you evaluate the result in zero. And that gives you the, uh, um, back the, your, your sequence. So it's a, it's a container for, for a sequence. And the other result is that um, uh, the high order derivatives of, well, any order derivatives of an exponential function can be found recursively. And this is an example for, uh, for a, a function of a, a single variable. So if you have e to the f, then if you define the nth derivative as y sub n, then you can find the next one uh, by taking an appropriate combination of all the previous ones. And you use also the derivatives uh, of the exponent only. So f. Uh, with j in parentheses is the jth derivative of f. So in particular, if f is a polynomial, let's say f is a polynomial of order k, what happens? If you want to, if you look at those f, those jth derivatives of f, let's say k is two, The question is, if you have a, a polynomial and you start taking derivatives of the polynomial, at some point, what happens? You get zero. Exactly, you get zero, right? So there is a finite number of those uh, of those elements in the sum. So if you have a polynomial of order k, then every derivative is a linear combination of the previous k plus one uh, um, derivatives, and the and the ones before don't matter. So you can, you can accumulate the, 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 the value of a derivative in this way. And so we realized that what we needed was an exponential function whose coefficients, whose uh, um, um, uh, Taylor coefficients are the matrix elements that we need. Because then we can, um, um, so essentially this exponential function would be a, a generating function, okay? And if we can manage to have the Taylor, uh, uh, um, uh, coefficients of this function be the matrix elements, then we can produce the matrix elements recursively by using this uh, higher order differentiation. And we can do that by uh, uh, taking the sandwich of the Gaussian uh, um, um, operator between two coherent states. So this actually happens. And if you, uh, if you take uh, any Gaussian operator and you switch it between coherent states, then the result is the exponential of a polynomial of order two. And this is extremely convenient because, because what, is, uh, what it's doing is that um, it's, it's allowing us to write every matrix element as a linear combination of another three matrix elements that we have already found. And if you, if you code it in a, in a computer, this is extremely fast because all it needs to do to find new matrix elements is to read from memory the previous ones it's a linear combination that always has the same coefficients and then write the new result. And it just, um, um, every matrix element is just created from the previous ones. So as you can see here, for example, we have uh, uh, for a single mode, uh, we need, so to, in order to create those two uh, uh, blue um, new elements, we need to combine the, the previous three ones uh, in, in, with, with a, in just in a linear combination. So what we do is we start from the vacuum, we seed the vacuum, and then the whole rest of the matrix comes out. Ah, and by the way, the, uh, if the formula needs values that are outside of the matrix, those are zeros. So it really works also in the, in the edges. 
And so these are some benchmarks. So the previous state of the art uh, uh, at the moment was, uh, I mean, when we were working on this was uh, Strawberry Fields. Uh, and it was probably the only package that could um, um, give you the, the matrix elements of, of any uh, transformation. Um, and we have compared it with, uh, with our implementation, uh, which uh, we uh, wrote in the Walrus library. And you can see that, so this is in log scale. Uh, and you can see that at, especially at the, at, on the right hand side, um, the, uh, the speed up is, is even more than 100 times. And we, we stopped there. Uh, we could have kept going, but then the, the green line was taking, was taking a lot. So, uh, <clears throat> but the, the, the nice thing about our method is that because it, it's so fast, uh, we can push the cutoff to in the hundreds. So we can um, uh, have multiple layers uh, of, uh, in our architecture and um, um, multiple layers with many gates per layer. We can have like uh, uh, tens uh, or hundreds of, of, of elements and it's still, it's still uh, quite fast. So finally, um, gate differentiation. I need to speed up a bit, I think. So uh, the thing is that if you take, for example, up, up top, there is a, 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 the example that I was showing earlier. So this is a new element is a linear combination of three previous elements. And the only thing, and this is a recurrence relation that we can just differentiate. So if instead of having, if, if instead of, of uh, asking for the, for the matrix element, you ask for the derivative of the matrix element, well, then you just differentiate. So the, the, um, both the um, matrix elements themselves and the coefficients may depend on that parameter. And so in general, you, you differentiate um, the formula, uh, <clears throat> the recurrence formula, and you get a new recurrence relation for the gradient of the gate. So it's, a, it's, a, it's trivially differentiable. And so what we can do now be, with this differentiable uh, uh, formula is that we can uh, apply gradient descent. And the idea here is that we can uh, take the output of the, of the circuit that will depend on the parameters and we can evaluate a loss function. And if you look at it, the loss function is just, is the loss function of the product between the, the circuit uh, transformation and the initial state. And then what we do is we, our goal is to decrease the value of the loss function, and then we just do gradient descent. So uh, we replace the, um, uh, the value of the parameters by the value of the parameters minus uh, the gradient multiplied by, by some learning rate. And so the gradient is the direction of steepest ascent. So we want to subtract that because we want to go, we want to, um, to um, decrease the value of the loss function. And I think you may, may have noticed that I wrote DL by D theta star. And, <clears throat> and that's because our parameters may be complex numbers. And when you want to do gradient descent with complex parameters, then uh, the, um, the steepest descent is given by the gradient with respect to the conjugate of, of the parameters. If, if they happen to be real, then it's the same formula, but if they're complex, uh, you need, the, you need the, um, um, the conjugate. Small detail, but important. Um, and so what we can do is we can apply the chain rule. And this is an example where we have a, a single, uh, a single gate, a single, sorry, a single layer. Um, and so if we want DL by D theta star, then there are two ways to reach theta star. And so we need to sum the two branches. And so, um, um, we have, as you can see, we have, uh, L is a function of, uh, psi, but psi itself is, uh, the product of G and the input. And so we have the, the L by the Psi, that's fixed. That's determined by our definition of the loss function. Um, the Psi by the G is the input state, right? That if you take the output and you differentiate it by, by G, you just get the input because it's a simple product. Uh, and then we have DG by the uh, theta star and that comes from the recurrence page relation. The other path is to go through uh, the L by the Psi star because very likely, actually, this happens all the time. The, the loss function is defined with some absolute value squared um, of the um, uh, of the of the output state, and um, or it's related to it in some way. And the absolute value squared is the state times the state conjugate. And we need to treat those two as as independent quantities. And so we have this other uh, branch to go to, uh, to to theta star. And so we have the L by the theta star, the theta star by the G star, the G star by the uh, um, theta star. So we have uh, this, this way of applying the chain rule that allows us to go from the output of the, of the uh, circuit 
all the way to the parameters. Um, and then this is back propagation. And then we have the gradients and we can update the parameters. And so now I want to show you a quick demo because nothing can go wrong when you do live demos. So I'll change to this. So I hope you can see my, my browser. This is Jupyter Notebook. Um, so um, what we're doing here is we are, so uh, my, um, uh, my student and I wrote a, a library to, uh, to uh, um, define these circuits and how many layers you want. And so for example, let's say that we, uh, that we set up a cutoff of 20. And so which means that we are um, uh, considering uh, up to 20 photons. Um, we have a single mode, let's say that we use eight layers um, and we define the input as just the vacuum. Okay, so we have uh, a vector of zeros and we replace in the first entry, we, we put a one, so that's the, the vacuum state. Um, and let's say that we want a circuit that produces a single photon, a clean single photon starting from the vacuum. So then the state out would be, would have a one in position one, right? So that, that's a, a single photon. And so what we say is that we tell the circuit that if, if we have this input, we want this output. And uh, so this is a, a, a initially this, the, the circuit is, is random. So what we see here is the output of each layer. Uh, and so we start with the vacuum and pretty much everything remains in the vacuum because all the parameters are initialized very close to zero. So it's as if each layer doesn't do much. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, let's say, 500 steps uh, of this optimization. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's pretty fast. And the loss function is one minus the fidelity. Uh, and so here we have already a fidelity of 99%. Uh, and it's uh, asymptotically getting better and better. Um, it will be done in a second. This used to take a lot longer before. And now we can see that as uh, the state evolves through the circuit, layer by layer, it becomes more and more uh, uh, closer to the objective, which is that of a single photon. And in fact, uh, at the output, we do have the probability, a probability one of having a single photon. We can also do this concurrently. So we can define multiple uh, uh, pairs of inputs and outputs. Um, and so we can, we can concurrently optimize uh, several inputs and several outputs. So I'm gonna go back to my slide. And let me uh, conclude. Um, so what we have done is we have developed this new and significantly faster optimization algorithm for uh, photonic circuits, optical quantum circuits. Um, we are not working on improvements, uh, for example, because I mean, uh, now I was using Adam, the Adam optimizer, but what we want to do is we want to develop things related to, uh, to the, the natural gradient. Uh, and the algorithmic gradient. So these are ways to take into account the, the topology of the, of the space of parameters. Um, and we want to apply this optimizer to real problems. Uh, for example, finding uh, error mitigation and error correction circuits uh, for, uh, uh, for, oops, for optical um, quantum computing. We want to design one way quantum repeaters, as I was mentioning at the beginning, and we want to design reliable and simple state sources. And with that, I want to thank my collaborators again, and thank you all for, for your attention, and I'm very happy to take, to take questions. Great, thank, thank you very much, uh, Filippo. So the floor is now open to questions. You're welcome to post questions in the chat or just unmute your microphone and uh, ask them over the audio. Hey, um, so I actually had a question about um, the optimization. So you mentioned you're doing um, that you have like two branches for for doing it, one with phi and one with phi star for doing the gradient. Um, yes. And is, is this done explicitly or through like TensorFlow's um, like automatic? Ah, uh, good question. So, um, right. Um, so, well, I mean, we are, we are um, um, basing what we do on TensorFlow and uh, TensorFlow um, is especially good for this because, so for example, we had tried with JAX, uh, but it wasn't playing well with non-holomorphic functions. And the thing is that we do have non-holomorphic functions, um, mm -hmm. but we need to explicitly 
so we need to customize the gradients of the gates. So we need to, I mean, um, TensorFlow is, is good up to a point. So for example, for, the, for, that, for that formula, uh, let me just bring it up again. Um, uh, I shouldn't be on the last, uh, hang on, I shouldn't be on the last slide because otherwise I cannot click on it without. Uh, one sec. Here. Um, so the first term that, that DL by the psi and the L by deep side star, those can be given to us by, uh, by TensorFlow because they are just a complex conjugate of each other. So TensorFlow actually gives us the second, it gives us the L by deep side star mm -hmm. uh, because it knows that, that psi is a complex number. So it already knows that the gradient should be the, the gradient with respect to the conjugate. Um, and all we do is we take the, the conjugate of that and we get the L by deep psi, but then the other ones, uh, uh, well, the input state, that's, that's also easy, but the, uh, the one from the recurrence relation, we need to be careful and, and we need to evaluate both independently. So does that not happen automatically if you specify like absolute value squared? Um, uh, well, it does, but then, but then um, because the point is that G is a complex function of a complex parameter, whereas L is a real function of a complex parameter. So TensorFlow knows how to deal with real functions of complex yeah. parameters, but not with, uh, complex function of complex parameters unless they are holomorphic, in which case okay. it doesn't matter whether you are complex or real. I see. But because they were non holomorphic, we had to do it ourselves. So you're saying that um, you were actually differentiating a complex function, not a real function. So you had to do a separate- Yeah, exactly, of exactly. Real because the- imaginary yeah. parts, okay. Yeah, I mean, real imaginary parts is one way to do it. We did it with a uh, uh, real calculus which treats uh, a, a, a complex variable and its complex conjugate as independent rather than real and imaginary parts. But it, that you can also do it with real and imaginary parts. Okay. I'm happy to talk more about it if you want to reach out later. Sure. So, so I had a question. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on the, the use of optical modes in your simulation. So you said, um, that you just set one optical mode. And what, what happens if you have more than one optical mode? Or can you optimize between modes? Like oh, well, ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. well, the, the, the circuit will be different. The architecture will be different mm -hmm. because the layers, so the, 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 the structure of the layers depend on, depends on the number of modes uh, because you want to be able to write the most general transformation for those, for those modes. So in the case of a single mode, it's sufficient to use a displacement, rotation, phase rotation, and squeezing. For a, uh, uh, I had it actually at the beginning. Uh, if you have, for example, two modes, then uh, or or multiple modes, then the general uh, shape, I mean, architecture of a layer would be to have a mode mixer, single mode squeezers, mode mixer again, single mode uh, displacement, and single mode care. So. Once we decide how many modes we want to optimize, this architecture is, is fixed. And then, then you just say how many layers you want. And, but could you, can you, can your input and output states be across different modes? Does that affect your optimization in any way or not? Oh, it can be across different modes. Uh, I mean, what, it, it, it depends how you define your, your loss function at the end. I mean, you, it's okay. a physical device. Okay. It simulates a physical device. So there will be something coming out of every mode. It could be the vacuum. It could be uh, another state. It could be something that you want to trace out and not care about. Um, it, all, it all depends how you define your loss function. Okay, I see. Okay. You can also, uh, for example, set some parameters as non-trainable. So for example, if you don't want a certain gate, you, you set the parameter to zero, you say it's not trainable and that's as if it wasn't there. Okay. So you have some flexibility. And just to give you a, um, 
some more info about uh, what we're doing now. Uh, so my student is working. So we found a way to compute the final uh, uh, state directly without computing the matrix first. Um, and so we have a faster way of, of, um, of computing the, the evolution of the state through a, through a, a Gaussian gate. So I have a, a, recurrence, a recurrence relation to find directly the final result without having to build the matrix and then take the matrix vector product. Mm. Great, so um, any more questions for Filippo? All right, well, if not, let's all thank Filippo for uh, the great seminar today. Um, again, uh, Filippo, maybe if you wanna post your email in the chat, if people have questions they wanna mm -hmm. follow up with you, sure. they can send that to you. Yes. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording and um, but feel free to ask something. Uh,